Okay, uh, well, I'm ready. Hi, everyone. Now I'm set up like a movie star. Let the show begin. Um, so this is a talk about uh, Specs 2. I don't know if you remember, but I did a talk about Specs 1. And uh, Specs 2 is a complete rewrite of Specs 1. So I'm going to explain why, how, and all that. So first of all, um, I must say that this all started with a big feeling of shame. Because, uh, and that's the puppy. Uh, when I presented Specs 1 in the first place, I was very happy. I had a nice Scala project with some kind of success and uh, doing some nice tricks with Scala as a DSL. So I explained all that. I was really happy. And then I realized, oh, I'm in the middle of a functional pro programming group. And uh, Specs was not at all functional. I mean, it was an horror in terms of mutability. And then I did the same talk for the Brisbane functional programming group. And I was pretty much uh, amazed that I just didn't receive rotten tomatoes or things yeah. like that. They were very kind to me because that's not functional at all. But actually, just uh, avoiding rotten tomatoes was not my only motivation. Um, my main motivation for doing something about specs was that I had lots of different issues, uh, lots of different bugs, and most of them were because of mutability. Uh, it's it's, it was really inevitable. Mutability was creating lots of stuff. So that was one reason to do something about it. Uh, the other one was concurrency. And one thing I wanted to do and that you want to do with any kind of testing framework at some point is to have tests passing fast. So you, have to, you want to run things in, uh, concurrently. And because you had mutability in different places in specs, it was just impossible. So I tried to. Then I said, OK, we have to, 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 to go a different route. I, I, I would not be able to do that the way it is. So I decided, oh, that's one more reason to do something about it. The last one was uh, that I wanted to be able to use specs to use uh, acceptance tests for, let's say, business users, so that they have something that's really readable for them and that's also executable. So to have some kind of executable documentation at a high level for the project. So I wanted to be able to write things like that. Uh, to have some tables where you could specify what kind of computations you wanted for finance, for example, and say, okay, that's not equal, and have some, you know, like customer stuff where if something goes wrong, you have tables, inside tables, showing exactly, okay, what was wrong when you try to execute your test on your, on your system. So I did something like that in specs that was already done, but it was not really well integrated with the rest of the, of the library. It was a bit awkward. So I finally decided I had to do something, and well, that's the why. And then I had an idea. Well, I must use functional programming, <laughs> right? That's why you're here. Uh, so we will see why, how I've been using this idea, what are the impacts in terms of the user using the library, because that's not completely transparent. Um, how this idea shaped also the, the design of the world library. And then I'll talk about a few just programming techniques that I've been using that I find interesting when you program with functional programming. So the idea is go functional. Okay, functional. Well, I've been using functions already. So what, what is it really that, uh, that is meant by this? And the idea that I got about functional programming was that the main idea is well, referential trans transparency. It's more like a function is like more of a mathematical function. Whatever you put in, you get always the same output. And this is, in my mind, very, very linked to immutability. So I had to think very differently about how I was going to execute the user specifications, how I was going to report it, and so on. And then I started rethinking also about how I was seeing the software in terms of uh, design in general. So I come from the object-oriented world where I used to have a view of my software as small little components cooperating together. And each of them has a state, and they send messages to each other. And depending on my state, I can, I can do something else, and I can give you a, a given service. So it's like some ants collaborating. And the actual behavior of the system is more or less emerging. It's very difficult sometimes to trace exactly what's happening, because you have all those small ants collaborating together. And on the other side, once I had this idea that functional programming was about taking something, 
processing it with a function and returning something else, it was pretty clear that in terms of the overall design, it was more like a, the behavior was very pipeline like in uh, motorways. So you have just one route to go and then you can decide to go on a different route and so on. And you have a, a lot more control on what you're doing. And actually this reflects now in specs too because uh, that's an actual line of code where I'm saying, okay, I'm taking the content of the specification, I'm selecting stuff that's interesting, I'm sequencing it to know which parts can be executed concurrently, then I'm executing and reporting. So this kind of pipeline, which I had in my mind about how I envisioned the software, can be pretty much written as it is in the, in the actual software. So that's pretty nice. But this had some uh, implications in terms of the actual DSL that the user would be using. So the first one, the first implication is that because you, you have to have this process, this pipeline, you need to start somewhere. So in specs one, you had some expressions like that where you would say that my system should do incredible stuff. But this should definition is apparently related to nothing. So when the spec executes, it's just side effects, changes a variable, registering the kind of behavior and specification, the test you want to do. Which is nice, I mean, in terms of pure DSL, because you just express purely what you want to do. You don't have to, to, to create definitions or li like you have in JUnit, you have to put everything under a test case, a test method that you have to name carefully and all that. So I really like the conciseness of it. But since I was not allowed mutable variables anymore, I said, okay, no, we have to find another way. So I just created a function, a method called is. Very simple, very short, very concise, but that's my starting point. So a specification in specs two is just a list of fragments, so-called fragments, and they start from somewhere from this is uh, definition. And they are linked with the small caret. It's just a matter of saying, a way of saying, that's the next fragment. I have lots of fragments specifying what I want to, to say about the system I, I'm about to, to code. Mm. Sure. Like, this change should from like a, a meta language. Yeah, true. A, true. So can I put the current character string do carrot incredible things? Can I say this is this system should do carrot incredible things? Uh, uh, yes, it will have us. Yeah, yeah, it will. I'm, I'm going to show you something yeah, like that. Right, this system should do incredible things always one string. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit more like this. We, we'll see later on. At, at the I, I, I will explain the, the example. Uh, so the other thing about having statements in the air like that is that I was also using that for, for nesting. So I would say in specs one, this system should do this, do that. And the thing is the do this, do incredible things is again side effecting. It's in the air. There's, it's not related to anything. So. In specs two, you have to relate stuff together. So you have another carrot. So line one is just a description. The system should, pure text. Line two is, well, uh, is an actual example. It's going to be executed. In this case, I have no specific expect expectation. I'm just saying this is okay. Okay is my result. And line two is another example saying, okay, yes, it does, another example. And they're all related through the, through the, the carrots. You might wonder why the carrot or why the bangs or why those symbols, and it's pretty simple. It's just that I use simple operators, and that's the precedence rules, uh, precedence rules in Scala. So uh, that's the, the, the best symbols to use to avoid to have uh, parentheses around expressions. So if I want to split the do incredible things string in two, I can just insert a plus in the, in the middle, and I don't have to put parentheses. So, well, that, that was dictated by the, the language itself. Uh, the thing is, the issue I had with this thing of having everything linked together as a big list is that I was previously using the nesting as a way to f implicitly format the result. So if I, the user would write, the system should do incredible things, it would go with uh, an indentation. And then if I had more example, I had more indentations. So nesting was nice, having those blocks, nested blocks. But then I realized that it was possible to do almost the same by just having an, a smart algorithm, a smart heuristic about it. 
So when I have an example following some text, I know I have to indent the example. If I have another text following an example, I know that I'm kind of in the same context, so I'm indenting again if I have sub-examples and so on. So that works pretty well, except that when you have a brand new context with a brand new text, like, but it should be also, you have to start from zero. That's what you would like to do in your specification. You don't want things to be indented forever. So I thought, okay, what can I do about it? Well, let's add one more annotation, one, one thing to help the algorithm to know when to restart the indentation. So then I started adding, playing with that, and adding some formatting fragments, as I call them. So you have n, but you can also um, have something like a paragraph, or a, a br, or a tabulation, or a back tab. So you have different ways of saying what kind of indentation you want. By default, you have the default one, which is OK. If you want to do fancy stuff, you can add more uh, fragments to format the, the layout of what's going to be reported. And then I realized, oh, but by the way, this way of doing this gives me also one thing I wanted for long, which was something which looked like an acceptance test, an acceptance specification with lots of text saying, okay, what, this is what my system should do exactly. And then on the right side of the screen, I can have the implementation. Okay, how it does it? How, I'm, how am I going to check with real code that this is, that what I'm saying here is true? So the end result is also uh, a new way of specifying and testing the Scala software, where you would write all the specification text as once, and then you would put all the code in a different place. Whereas in the previous version of spec, you would have description, code, description, code, description, code. So it's a different way of doing stuff. Um, and then, so I went on taking all the features of specs one by one and checking if I could implement them in a purely immutable way. And one difficult thing, uh, maybe the most difficult, was the way we deal with context in specs because it's a bit magic. Well, if you declare a value in the shield block like that, and if you mutate that value in the first example, you will still be able to execute the second example as if the value has, uh, had never been changed. And that's very handy, it's very helpful because you don't have to reset any state or do anything, it's brand new state. Uh, but that's a nightmare to implement. So I implemented that by doing a clone of the full specification and just executing the part I was interested in. So then I would have brand new variables, brand new data, brand new context. And because I was doing that pr plus m mutable variables, it was a real nightmare to maintain. And I had lots of bugs because of that cool functionality, just impossible to implement. So then I decided for Specs 2 to use actually something that you have in Scala, the ability to create any context anytime you want. It's called a case class. You create a class. It's case class, so you don't have to say new when you instantiate it. And then you have a new object with new values wherever you want. So I can say use, it's a new object, and I put my examples directly in this case class. Yeah, I put my expectations directly in this case class. So the use case class is the context for my specification. So I can set up data and I can say, okay, for this data, you have to check this and that. That was useful. Um, then I did similar things for uh, things like do before method, which is used in spec to set up the state of the database before executing anything, for example. And again, this can be done by using uh, objects with an apply method. So maybe I won't go too much into the detail, but you have some nice uh, syntax trick in, in Scala, which allow you to have some very concise syntax. So I can say with DB E2, and it's actually calling an apply method on the uh, with DB object. And the apply method is provided by the before trait you have here. And the before trait makes sure that the before method is called before calling the apply method. So that we have the setup taking place. We can also check that the setup was okay. If there's an exception, we don't execute anything more. And the, if all, the, all of that is okay, I can execute my example to show that everything works fine. So this had um, this was really not transparent for the user. The way of writing specifications really changed because of no mutability. That had a, a big impact. As we'll see later, there's a way to reintroduce some mutability to get back all the, the nice syntax. 
Now, in terms of design, um, we have lots of things to do on a, on, a, on a single specification. So if I say, okay, that's, I have some text, I have one example describing my system, then another example, and then it's, it's finished. I have lots of things to do. I have, for example, I have to select which examples are interesting because I can tag one example and say, this one is too slow, don't execute it. Or I can say, just execute the one that failed before or things like that. Then I have to sequence, because I want things, examples to be executed concurrently, I, have a, I, I need to have a way to know which portion can be executed concurrently. And maybe if the user says, oh, I want this portion to be purely sequential, then I, I, he has to annotate the specification to say, okay, that part is sequential. So there's a bit of sequencing of what can be concurrent, what cannot be. Then I need to pass uh, all sorts of arguments for, to control the execution, the reporting, and so on. I need to execute stuff to see if uh, the system is okay. I need to compute the levels of indentation for the reporting and the statistics, how many failures, how many expectations, and so on. And then I have different outputs to text, to HTML, to IDs, and so on. So I have bunch, a bunch of things to do. And the way I did that in, uh, in Specs 1 was really not the good way. And again, it started with a simple idea, and maybe because I was influenced by, I don't know, Haskell, about let's use laziness. So let's say if I want to know what's the result of executing my specification, I take the first block, I open it, and I say, do you have your results? And the block says, oh, no, I don't have my results uh, because I have several examples. And he says, OK, what about the examples? Do you have your results? And each, uh, each example say, oh, no, I don't have the results. So I'm going to execute myself. And then I'm going to report you back the results and so on. And this, again, because of that, because of all other features, uh, it was very difficult to implement properly, too much laziness. And then I realized that, and I think this is true for most DSLs, and maybe Tony could say a word about that, is that in a way it's better to have a structure describing your computations and to, have to separate the algorithm on how you're going to evaluate that and cleanly separate the two. So in specs two, I have, I have what I want to do with different steps, and then I have uh, objects which are going to process that in a specific order, and for example, I can say, I can insert some fragments which say, okay, that should be, that cannot be executed concurrently with the rest. It has to be executed at the end when all the examples have been executed. And I can say, okay, I want my whole specification to be sequential in that case. So I can pass arguments in, in that specification block. And then I had another idea, which was I read this paper and I really found it really nice and this paper was really amazing to me because it was basically saying, you know the for loop you've been using for years? It's not what you think. Well, what, what do you mean it's not what I think? So yeah, it's not what you think because it's doing many things, several things at the same time. For example, it's, it's extracting values out of a data structure, which is a list in this case, and iterable, let's say, in, in Java. It's doing some kind of mapping, transforming those values to something else. And maybe it's doing some accumulation. It's accumulating stuff. So, and then it's returning the mapping, which is in a, maybe in the shape of the old data structure, and it's returning some measure of what was inside the data structure. And that paper was really interesting because I thought, that's, that's what I have to do. I have my sequence to evaluate, and I have lots of things I want to do to get out of it. I want to get the results. I want to get the report. I want to get stuff. And if I can compose all those features together and do that in a single traversal, wow, that would be a nice way to, to design my, pro my program. So I went on reading the paper, and the paper says, OK, you just need an instance of traverse. And list or sequence is just an instance of traverse. And so it's a data structure. And then you need something doing the mapping using an applicative. And the applicative is something that's going to do the mapping, the accumulation, and all that. OK, what is it? An applicative is very simple. It's like a box. You can put values in the box. And if you have a function in the box, you can apply it to another value in the box. That's simple, very simple. And it's also very composable. And you also have lots of instances. So for example, state, the state monad, is, can be made applicative. So you can use it, for example, I was thinking, oh, I can use it to compute the levels. Because 
to know the given level of indentation of a fragment, it's depending on what's before in the sequence. Or maybe I can use that. I can use a monoid to compute the statistics because I have to accumulate the results for each execution. I thought, well, one, nice. But uh, so I tried, I tried to do it in Scala and it was atrocious, I, uh, really horrible. Because of uh, type inference, it was just impossible to get nice expressions which could be read by anyone. It was a nightmare. So well, I decided that's not for me. I need to do something else. Uh, good news is that I revisited the subject recently. I wrote a really long blog post about it. I don't know, several hundred, hundred lines. I think there may be a way to hide some of the ugliness a bit. Uh, so I, there may be a way around that. So I, I may revisit that in the future. So you're saying that the type inference is hard because Scala can't do it and you have to write lots of annotations? Yeah, yeah. You, you have to write horrible type annotations. And most of it is because you cannot do partial type application. Okay. Because the state of A, B, as an applicative has to be seen as applicative of B and forget about A, it's, so it's fixed. So that's what Pascal calls constructive classes? I don't know. So, so, so monad is a constructive class, so it's a class over something which can't describe itself, is that right? It's, yeah, and then you're applying the first type variable to uh, obtain another type. Can't okay. for now. There's a ticket open. <laughs> There's a ticket uh, <laughs> open for that. For, it's been open for a long time, and I think that's going to be difficult. Uh, so I had a discussion actually with uh, Dominic Verity while he was here uh, last year, because I read something else about using a reducer, and a reducer is something with, which is basically using a monoid. So if if you can approximate what I want to do, the accumulation, the mapping, and all that to a monoid, I that could work. And because with the reducer, you can put something in the reducer, so you can map stuff, and you can do the aggregation with the monoid. The thing that's a bit difficult to do is to do the, the state part of it. And then, yeah, the interesting stuff was the composition. If I have a reducer for something, like, say, the, a reducer to compute the statistics, I can have another reducer to do the display. I can put them together, get another reducer that's going to traverse all my structure at once, and then I get all the results I need. So that's nice. That's the full map operation using uh, Scala Z, which I've been using a lot on, uh, in the implementation of, uh, of Specs 2. So then I have different reducers to compute the levels, the statistics, to pass the arguments because you can have different arguments for different parts of the specifications to produce the text or the HTML or whatever. So that was my overall design and I mean that proved to be very effective. I was able to nicely structure the, the software to keep everything immutable and all that. So that was nice. And then in a small, I discovered also lots of uh, functional programming techniques you would say. And one of them, which is um, certainly fairly common for you, but that was the first time I was using that, was trees. And let's just give an example of how you can use trees and Scala Z trees, especially, speci and how I use that. So in Specs2, you have a list of fragments, but because they implicitly have a level, you can transform that to a, to a tree of fragments and text and examples and results and all that. And usually that's the kind of thing you need to do uh, the, the reporting in a JUnit tool. And I mean, that's a big part of specs. If you have a specification tool, it's better if it's well integrated with all the ideas, all the tools on the market, the continuous integration and all that. So I needed to find a way to transform the results of my specifications as a tree to something which in JUnit is actually just an object, just an object with lots of references to sub-objects for all the sweet descriptions. So how do I do this? Well, that's fairly easy, actually. Because you have nice primitives for trees in Scala Z, the first thing you can do is just a mapping. You say, OK, every node of my tree, I map that to a corresponding uh, JUnit description. And there's a correspondence you can do. That's not too difficult to do. The next thing I need to do is to fold up all that tree of JUnit description into one object where I don't have any more tree node elements. 
I just have uh, links, direct references. And this is done with just one function. I mean, that's called uh, bottom-up folding. You, you just describe what you want to do with each node and each of the children. And you want to say, OK, just attach them one by one, and that's done. And all the rest of the library takes care of that for you. And I would say the, the funny thing is that after having working, worked on that, I, you could think, oh, that's, that's the kind of thing you do after work. But I don't know, months later, I had a colleague coming to me and say, oh, I want to export a hierarchy of books. How do you do that? And I want to export that web service into one single object with simple references. And I thought, oh, that's exactly my journey problem. I, it's the same stuff. Just take functional Java, and it's coded with three lines. And I did it. <laughs> but um, he said, oh, that's too complex for me. So let's not use it. OK. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, what's called tree lock in Scala Z, but what's actually zipper. And uh, I had to use that because I was building trees. So maybe that's uh, fairly common to you. But to someone coming to functional programming to the f in the first place, it's very intriguing. When you have a tree structure, you say, OK, I want to create it. I want to update nodes. Where do I start? It seems to be impossible to keep things immutable. So you have to know about zippers. And once you know about that, it's actually fairly easy to use them. And you, c you can update stuff as if it was a pure uh, mutable tree. So one way I've been using this is uh, to build a table of contents for the HTML I was creating. So when I create the HTML, the user can use a markdown a wiki markup in his specification. So it will have some titles, h1, h2, and so on. Bunch of titles in, a, in, the, in the file. So the idea is to be able to parse the file, get all the headers, and reconstruct a tree for, for that to display it as a table of contents in the, in the HTML document. And again, with tree locks, it's very easy to do. I was really happy to be able to use uh, zippers to do that. And I must say as a reference that the XML library in Scala has, is being kind of rewritten. Well, let's say there's a concurrent uh, library in Scala being rewritten at the moment called anti-XML, which is purely functional, very fast, and again, using zippers all over the place. And from what I heard, pretty complex zippers to be able to do stuff with, uh, with XML. And yeah, and, and that's the other, the other thing uh, where I was very, very happy with functional programming and Scala Z in particular was concurrency. Because let's face it, I'm not very good with threading. I'm not very good with concurrency in general. And I keep hearing that's a difficult problem. And, and that was just solved with one line uh, in specs too. If I want to execute things concurrently, I just have to create a promise. That's a concurrent task. So I take the list of things I want to execute. For each of them, I create a promise, and I use the sequence method. And that's, that's all. So from a, a list of promises, the sequence method is going to create a promise of a list. And when I get it, it all executes concurrently, gathers the results, and I don't have anything more to do. That, to me, it's pure magic. And uh, the fact that I can do that with just one line of code, it's, it's really nice. And I know it's working because everything is immutable. So it's a real win-win situation. Well, I had a look at the internals of the, the promise stuff in Scala Z, and I, I cannot say I understood everything. So it's using actors and queues and continuations. It's pretty complex, but well, it works. And yeah, one other thing that's also interesting with this implementation uh, is that you can pass a specific executor, specific thread pool that you can configure to, to change your execution if you need. Uh, I'm not sure you can do that with the new parallel collections uh, in, uh, in Scala 2.9. You, you can create your own thread pool with a fixed number of threads. Yeah. And then the, the current class runs on that. that yeah, thread. because the sequence method is expecting an implicit parameter for this in the scope. Which is the, the, the pool of threads. Yeah. So can you have the a, executor, actually. Can you have multiple, say if you have eight cores, can you have four threads doing something and four threads doing something else? I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah. You're thinking about distribution? Well, if you have a pool of pools. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, po possibly. Yeah, possibly. Well, like if you have a thread pool, and then one of those threads in that pool creates a new thread pool, and then one of those threads in that pool creates a new thread pool, does that, does that work? With, with Scala Z? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Honestly, no, no idea. 
Uh, I think that's something similar that's done uh, with the parallel collection in Scala. That's what they do, and they do work stealing also. So supposedly really smart. The only question I have about the parallel collections is I don't know how you configure that. Because there must be some magic constant somewhere to say, OK, when you stop uh, forking stuff and joining stuff. So uh, I don't know how you can access that. But for all I needed, that was really uh, uh, efficient and working OK. Um, the next thing I discovered is that exceptions are, are really bad in terms of uh, programming and uh, functional style. They are inevitable because you have sometimes to parse strings to, to get int uh, from the configuration or whatever. So you have to deal with exceptions at some point in, in your program, but uh, it's, it's just horrible. Because when you have an exception, let's say in Java like that, you have to have a try-catch block somewhere. And you have to do something about it right now. And uh, this is really not going into the flow with functional programming, where you can just take values and pass them around. For example, what do you do if you have a bunch of actions in the list, and then you, you want to execute what's inside the list? What do you do with the, the exception you catch? Do you accumulate it? Do you stop the execution? Well, it's not really pretty. And once you realize that your, uh, the type of the function that you're invoking is actually an either type, it's either everything goes OK, I have a T, or everything goes wrong, I have an exception. And that either type has, I mean, more useful functions on it you can use. You can use map. You can project just the left part, just the right part, and so on. So what I did with specs too is that I created lots of small utility functions to catch those exceptions as soon as possible and to transform them to, to something else. So the, the main one is try E for try either, returning that either type. Uh, and then I have try or, where the exception is transformed to something else using a function. I have try or else, where I just provide another value, a uh, default value if something goes wrong. Uh, try O returns an option. I don't care about the exception. Try map is just mapping, OK, if it's OK, I, I need this value. If it's not OK, I need another value. And if it's OK, I just return true. I don't really, it don't, doesn't really matter uh, what was the value or whatever. I just want to say, OK, that was true. I didn't get an exception. That's enough for me to go on with my computations. So exceptions, bad. Try to catch them as soon as possible. Um, the other thing I discovered was that I, I was m less and less needing uh, mocks. So previously, I was, I was used in a kind of uh, object-oriented fashion of designing the software, of having parts doing stuff. And then when you want to test another part, you just mock part A to test part B and so on. But when you don't have side effects and you have functions all over the place, it's pretty easy to just pass in a, a dummy function or whatever you need to do that, 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 mopping, that mocking you do with Mokito. The only time where you need actually Mokito, for example, to do some, some real testing is when you have side effects. And I still have some side effects when I'm uh, talking to JUnit because I'm mutating some objects, when I'm uh, talking to a, an interface for the IDE, or so on. So I'm still using mocks in different places, but not so much as before. Um, and then the, the last thing I discovered, um, maybe not the last, previous last, uh, was that mutability is not such a bad thing. I mean, it can be good. Uh, and so I re reintroduced it. So now in specs too, you can, you can use this syntax. Because let's face it, it's, it's very concise. It's very practical. So I said, OK, I will just allow one mutable variable in my whole uh, project, just one. And I just want to use it to be able to create those up in the air fragments so that they can be registered somewhere. And then all the rest will be immutable. So the construction part of the specification is not con uh, thread safe, concurrent, and so on. But then everything is OK. And because of this, I have nothing to insert there. And also, um, I used exceptions again. So uh, this expectation in spec, pure specs too, when you have a statement like that, this is just ignore. I just take the value of the rest. If you use the mutable style, you can, you can use this. And that was really, I think, really a pragmatic decision. And it was also motivated by the fact that, well, I have a user base. I have people which are, who are using specs, uh, some, some of them every day. And I cannot come to them and say, oh, I discovered functional programming. That's so cool. You have to rewrite all your specifications. Bye. So 
Uh, so I told them, okay, there's a way. There's a way to translate more or less the old specifications to the new ones. And it's not completely seamless because I've, I've rationalized a few things. I took the opportunity to revisit some of the small choices. But more or less, most of the people have been able to migrate the old spec to the new specs too. And also that also explains why I called the new project specs 2 and not just specs version 2 is that I wanted to make clear that those were two separate projects and you can do your migration progressively. You don't have to migrate all the specs at once. You can just keep the old ones and uh, migrate them uh, along the way. And yeah, the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, something uh, which I, I think is a problem with func functional programming and I've seen some uh, functional pairs dealing with that is configuration. So when you uh, load mutation, it's very nice because you can say, I put all my configuration somewhere and everyone can access it and maybe modify it. And uh, so it's not so nice. But that's very useful. That's very convenient in a way, even if that creates lots of issues and bugs. And I said, OK, I don't want this anymore. So I need lots of different parameters to control the way specs are executed or the way they are reported. And I said, OK, those parameters are going to be passed by the users and declared at the beginning of the specification. So I have, thanks to Scala syntax, which is pretty flexible, I can pass arguments using name parameters, or I can have some arguments can be even more complex, being objects themselves, doing nice stuff like uh, computing the differences between two strings using the Levenstein dis distance, things like that. So I can have nice arguments, and they are passed with the rest of the specification. But the thing is, when you have to pass configuration parameter to each and every operation, so as a new parameter, I don't know how you do that usually using functional programming, but it's very tedious. Like you have to pass the state of the world all the time with you. Um, so there's a way to do that in Scala, which is uh, I found very very convenient. So one way to do it is okay. Let's say I have my arguments as a case class containing lots of values, all my con options, all my configuration stuff. I can have implicit parameters in a, in a function. And those implicit parameters can have default value. So when I use the computed uh, function in uh, client one, it's going, if I, if I have no implicit parameters in scope, it's going to use the default value. And the nice thing is that for client two, if I provide some different implicit parameters in scope, it's not going to use the default value, it's going to use the implicit one. And that's, that's very useful. That's a nice way to provide generic arguments, have them being overridden locally. And locally, you don't have to pass them explicitly. You can just say, OK, they're implicit in my scope. And that solves lots of the issues. So when I execute this, the first line is going to return false, because that's the default value. And the second one, the second line is going to return true, because that's the implicit value. Um, and well, that's what I discovered. So I would say I got a lot of uh, reli reliability by using functional programming. And you, I mean, really, the, the peace of mind you get is, is huge. And uh, um, one other thing that's not written in the conclusion is also debugging. I found that debugging was immensely uh, simplified. Because you have an issue, and you're like doing a giant bisect on the world program. You say, OK, at some point, there's something wrong. but Let's see if the first part of my program is OK. I pass some data. I have something else. And then, OK, that's OK. Now I take the second part. Is it OK or not? And you focus on the issue. And because you, you don't have to reconsider the state of everything, it's really simplified. Uh, I really love that, that aspect. The concurrency was a breeze. Uh, composition, I think I got more composition with the reducer stuff. I wished I could use the traversable and all that because I think it's, it's even a more concise way of describing stuff. So I'll have another go at that. And less mocks. And I really like the fact that sometimes mutability is also good. Most of the time, you say, OK, that's bad. Don't do it. And sometimes, you can st if the fact that uh, with Scala, I can still use it when it makes a difference, that's really nice. Um, what was this point? I don't even remember. DSL, supposedly a bad point. But yeah, no, this has an impact on the DSL. That's what I said in the beginning. Uh, when I started, I saw, OK, you have this starting point. You have to chain everything. So if you don't have mutability, it forces the user to add more 
operators or more stuff to keep things together. Uh, type inference was really hard. Uh, and well, the learning curve. It took me at least one year, and I think that's just the beginning of the trip. Uh, it's, it's steep. Um, well, so I'm not surprised that a colleague of mine told me that's too complex, your stuff, because it really takes time to get used to and to experiment with it. That's it. Oh, any questions? Questions? Ta -da. <laughs> Good? I think we're done. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome.